Hello and welcome to our talk about uh, Android automation testing and getting the flake out. I'm Sandeep, I'm an Android developer in uh, American Express. Uh, my name is Jarek, I also do some Android uh, at Amex. Uh, as we all know, we live in the world of uh, GDPRs, uh, all the terms and conditions that uh, you have to accept, but not many people read. So I have to start say with saying that all the views we present in this talk, they're our own. We do not talk for our employer. Uh, and although we came up with idea for this talk after removing flakiness from our tests, from our, our code base, uh, the solutions we're going to present you, they're general and they're applicable to every single Android project. There's nothing strictly Amex related. And all the code samples you will see, they, they are general. They, 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 they do not come from American Express code base. Uh, and from our experience after removing flakiness from our UI tests, uh, we figured out that fl fl flakiness of UI tests is uh, quite a complex topic. So you can't only fix the test and be happy. You should look at it a bit more broad. Uh, that's why we decided to talk about many different aspects. So we'll talk about a bit about the architecture or patterns you can use for your UI tests. Uh, we'll talk about the tools that may improve execution of your UI tests. And then we'll talk about some of tricks and hacks, I would say, you can use uh, to reduce the flakiness. Okay, uh, so first let's talk about the architecture. How many of you have any sort of architecture or like pattern in your UI tests? Anyone? Okay, just a few of you. Okay, so how many of you are familiar with something which is called robot pattern. Okay, yeah, that's, that's uh, pretty good. Uh, so robot pattern was introduced uh, by Jake Wharton uh, at the end of, maybe you heard about this guy somewhere. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we have a link to his talk and it's, uh, it's very good deep dive into and he explains all the details how the robot pattern uh, is built and why you can use. We'll also explain it, but we won't go as deep. Uh, and this is, this is just a pattern, so you can apply to many different platforms, it, it's not Android specific, uh, and you can implement it in many ways. Something we'll explain to you is the way we implemented this, so you may understand the pattern in a different way and implement it in a way it's more useful for you. So when we apply the robot pattern, our tests look more or less like the one you can see on the screen. So it should be, uh, even the, the screen is not very readable, uh, the test should be fairly easy to understand. So uh, as you can see, we are on the screen, the payment detail screen, and then we, we do something. We verify that payment is disabled, so you can't pay. Then we input amount, we input tip, and then we check that, the, that I can pay now. So this is how the test looks like after applying the robot pattern. Okay, and now what's the robot? Basically, robot uh, looks more or less like this. It's a bit more complex, uh, but I'll explain you, you all the details in a second. So the most important part of uh, robot pattern is separation of, it, it improves the separation of concerns. You can separate the what you are testing, so like sort of business logic of your UI testing, from how you do. So this is the implementation details. And as you can see, the test is sort of like a platform independent. It's a platform agnostic. We, there's just a Kotlin, which looks basically like a Kotlin DSL, right? And the robot contains all the Espresso code. So if you have to do any change, for example, you change the ID, you change uh, the string, you only have to modify the robot. You don't have to modify the test. Uh, so uh, it's super useful to separate those two concerns. Uh, and another side effect of, side effect of uh, using robot pattern is that the assertions you can see on the screen, for example, the on view with ID, payment button check is not enabled. When you see this in the code, you have to go through this. You have to check, okay, what's the ID and what I'm doing? With the robot pattern, it's enough if you read the name of the method. So this is like, the, thanks to this, our tests are very readable and you know exactly what the assertion is doing. Okay, so let's now have a look how to build a robot. 
Uh, let's start from the entry point. Uh, as you can see, there is no constructor. Uh, instead of constructor, we are using a top uh, inline top level function from Kotlin. So the function takes uh, as a parameter lambda, which is an extension on the robot, and it returns a robot to which we apply all the, all the functions. So basically, uh, we are building the DSL. Uh, and all the assertions and actions we can take on the view, they're defined in a robot. Uh, so you can see that uh, they're just the functions. So this is uh, basically our DSL. Uh, and yeah, that's, uh, that's how our, our robot looks like. Uh, there's also one extra thing we can do, because this is Kotlin DSL, right? So there's one extra thing we can do, uh, like a small thing, uh, like a cherry on a cake, uh, which is uh, DSL markers. Uh, we can use them to limit the scope of the robot and make sure that we are not breaking the syntax. We are not calling the function we're not supposed to call from our robot. Uh, so, so far, so good. This is, uh, we usually use one robot per screen. But what if you would like to use the robot on more screens? Or what if you would like to train the robots? Because like, usually we know that it's very easy to implement something in a small scale. But when, when, you, when you scale this up, all the problems bubble up. So spoiler alert, robot tests incredibly good, scales incredibly good. So this is an example of a flow test, or uh, you can call it end-to-end -end test. Uh, so as you can see, we have uh, functions which are basically calling like on screen, on screen, on screen. All of them, they are inputs to our new robots. So let's have a look how, how to build this one. Uh, the trick is uh, using function, which is an infix, uh, which takes exactly the same input to the next robot. So basically, this is the transition. It's a function which is a transition to the new robot. Uh, and we are using infix just to use, use it in a, a bit more Kotlin way. So you don't have to use any dot, any parentheses. So you can have a really nice looking uh, chain of calls. Uh, so as you can see, the robot pattern is, seems to be really good fit for Kotlin. Uh, we use many, many functions of, of, of the language, like top level functions, infix, uh, DSL markers. So it's, it's, it's really good fit. OK, and just to. Uh, sum up the robot pattern. So it gives you like extra separation of concerns. You can separate how you test something from what do you, how, <laughs> sorry, you can separate how you do test something from what. Uh, it's uh, platform agnostic and uh, all the assertions and verifications, they are meaningful. So it's, it's super easy to understand the robot. Uh, the code is reusable because you, you can use it in the, UI test, you can use it in a flow test, and you don't have to repeat yourself at all. Uh, nice side effect is that we have a descriptive stack traces. I guess you all know how a stack trace from Espresso looks like. It prints the entire view hierarchy, and it may be not very easy to find the view. You have to, you have to basically check what, where is the view and understand what, what the field is missing. When you apply a robot pattern, the output tells you the line of code, tells you which function fails. So thanks to this, you go immediately to the function and you have the assertions. So you, can, you know exactly which view or with which ID and what you, you've been checking. So this is like, it uh, speeds up development uh, a lot. Uh, so that will be all about robot pattern. Uh, now Sandeep will tell you more about tools you can use. Yep, so that was about the um, how you use architecture to solve some of the test issues. And let's talk about some of the tools we think are very useful to have a good test setup and also to reduce some flakiness. Um, the first one in the list is Wimok. And can I see some hands, please? Who knows and have used Wimok? All right. Um, so Wimok is 
mock server um, and you can configure it to um, respond to your HTTP request um, in a highly configurable way. So why do we use Wimock? Um, it's, the origin is from um, how you organize your test. So there's, uh, we talk about something called test pyramid. So different organizations have a different distribution of tests. So typically a lot of unit tests and some module tests and end-to-end um, -end tests. But when your app is a, like a complex multi-region app with a lot of feature flagging and the varying number of features, um, we believe that there's a lot of value in having a lot of end-to-end -end tests rather than just testing the views using Espresso. So that's where YMO comes in um, to test complete use cases. Um, so if you have like a, you know, a splash screen or a login screen, go to your next screen and uh, go to your feature screen, validate all the scenarios. And how is YMOC going to help you? Is by um, using configurable responses. So like I said in the beginning, you can configure it to return different um, responses based on your scenarios, pretty much like Mokito or any other uh, mocking framework we use in the JUnit world. Um, the, again, YMOC can be configured to um, reply with a JSON file instead of having the response coded in the test code. The advantage of that, we believe, is you separate the test data from the test code. Um, and yeah, that gives a nice separation. And one other advantage, which is not exactly related to test, is that if your server is developing parallelly um, while you're doing the app, and you don't have a server to talk to, so YMO can be of help to you, because you can ask Wiremark to respond in a way the server would, and that helps you doing a little bit of parallel development. All right. so how do you configure Wiremark? It's fairly straightforward. I'm not talking about the server configuration, but more about test configuration here and how you get the scenarios back. Um, this is a sample configuration for the Wiremark scenario. Uh, what we call a flow is typically a use case. And uh, here you can see that the based on a parameter, we are asking Wiremock to res reply with uh, two different um, JSON files. And let's go maybe line by line on that. Um, the highlighter line where you have your service slash path is your API you're testing in that use case. And then um, there is this very helpful function in Wiremock with body file, which can return your JSON. And then based on the scenario you're testing, you can have different JSON files. Just, um, I mean, JSON file retrieved from the mock server. Um, let's see how the test looks like. So this is the um, test. So you need to uh, you need to define a YMOC rule um, in the beginning, and then you add a flow which was defined in the previous slide, um, and then pass the scenario if success equal true. So you're going to get the successful response, uh, and then you just verify if user is logged in because this is a login flow. And the, um, the good thing about this is that it can be tweaked to test the, just the opposite scenario, which is a val invalid login um, with just tweaking if success equal to false. And then you will be testing for a verify an error dialog is displayed or something like that. It's quite reusable. And what are these response stubs we are talking about? Um, it looks pretty much like this. So, you can organize your um, API response and the variations of it in a directory and then tell Wiremock to return this based on the scenario you pass. So you get a success response for the straightforward call and then um, an error response for um, an invalid password or whatever it is. Um, you can have multiple scenarios and then yeah, your when block gets extended. Right, so the second tool we would like to talk about is Test Orchestrator. It's part of um, Android framework, um, self um, test framework. And what does it do is uh, it gives you the following benefits that it has minimal shared state between the tests. So if you have a test class and then you're testing one after the other, and if there's a state which is stored from the first test, then if you're running it locally, it may pass, but then when you run it on a CI system, it may be executed in a different order or whatever, and then it may fail. Um, so this gives you a good isolation, 
um, between the different individual tests and also if one test crashes it doesn't fail the whole thing but it just continues and goes on and gives you um, something like you know one out of 99 failed or something like that. Um, the other advantage is test orchestrator enables parallel execution and it's hugely helpful when we go to the next tool but even even if you are running in your CI um, it helps to kind of slice it down and then um, execute everything parallelly. And the next tool on the list is Firebase Test Lab. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Firebase and the Firebase Cloud Services. So Test Lab is one of the um, Firebase services and it helps execute your tests on a wide range of physical and virtual devices without worrying too much about maintaining a device farm or anything like that. Um, so you could configure your CI to run all your espresso tests, maybe 1,000 or 2,000, doesn't matter, on Firebase. And um, so every PR you make will run all the tests, and that gives you a very good confidence to merge your PR and make sure that nothing breaks. So, um, it, it's, And uh, Firebase gives you a lot of features to debug your failures. Um, to start with, it has logs and video recordings. So, so video recordings are hugely helpful uh, when, you exact, when you know what exactly is going wrong. And also, if there's a failure, you can run any individual tests in your test suite. Um, so you don't have to run your all your 2,000 tests again, but just run the single one with Google Cloud SDK. So if you install Google Cloud SDK on your um, development machine, um, you can just upload that. Um, I, I upload the whole APK, but just run the uh, run the single test, which is failing. It's quite useful as well. And uh, one um, guideline, if you will, is to run all your uh, configure FTL to run um, all your tests on a low resolution resolution device, um, and if possible. Um, an older API. Um, so it will uncover a lot of um, issues with the low-end devices, and we'll talk about some of this in the coming slides. And uh, the next tool in the list is Flank, um, and this is somewhat combined with the Firebase story. Uh, Flank is a parallel test runner for Firebase Test Lab, and what does it do? It's going to this, uh, it's called test sharding. Um, it's actually bucketing your tests into groups and then distributing them on all these virtual and physical devices. If you were to do it manually, you would have to have a configuration and organize the test, but you will have no idea about how long each test is to um, take and then um, on what basis you are going to group it, something like that. So Flank is the solution there, uh, we believe, and um, it doesn't have much of configuration, just a minimal configuration file, and it's quite intelligent. It remembers each um, run and how long it takes, and then it optimizes every time. So first time you run um, your Firebase test lab test with Flank, it's going to take a really long time, and then um, every time you test, it's going to optimize and um, save you a lot of time. And uh, it saves a lot of time and it saves a lot of money because Firebase is charged based on the duration and um, because Flank optimizes your execution time, it saves quite a lot of money for the organization as well. Um, let's see what the minimal configuration looks like. Um, so this is a YAML file for Flank and uh, maybe let's go section by section. So the first part is for your project configuration, your project name in Firebase, and whether you want to record video, um, timeouts, and stuff like that. And the second part is where your APK is quite self-explanatory, where your Android test APK is, and if you want to use test orchestrator. And then your device configuration here. And then this is where Flank starts its magic, where we can tell how many groups um, you want to divide your test suite into, and then Flank gets to that target. Uh, yeah, that was about the tools um, we believe will help you to get rid of a little bit of test flakiness from your test suite. And then Eric will continue talking about the, some of the tips and tricks. OK, so uh, let's assume that we have a reorganized architecture of our tests. We're using super fancy tools. But what if the tests are still flaky? 
Uh, so maybe let's think why actually the tests are flaky. Uh, the first thing which should come to our mind is uh, threading, actually multi-threading, which is hard. Uh, our app runs on uh, UI or main thread, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and uh, espresso tests, they run on instrumentation thread, right? So that's the point when we have to synchronize the threads. Uh, all the, fortunately, all the heavy lifting is done under the hood by espresso. Uh, espresso waits for the app to be idle. So what does it mean the app is idle, right? It's like nothing going on the screen. So it waits for the message queue to be empty and the activity will, should be in the on resume state. That's when Espresso tells, okay, I'm idle, so I can execute the test. Uh, so Espresso ex ex executes the runnable, and then it propagates the result to you, and that's when you see if the test passes or, or failed. Uh, but as I said, synchronization is hard, so Espresso sometimes may not notice or may not know that there's something still going on on the screen, and the test fails, right? Because it doesn't know. Uh, so for example, like maybe there's a keyboard on a device, you dismiss the keyboard, uh, and there's a button behind. Espresso test says, oh, okay, uh, I'm idle, so I should check that there's a button, but the keyboard is still going on down, uh, so the button is not visible, test fails. Uh, animations, they don't help uh, with the flakiness at all. It's recommended to uh, run the test uh, with the animations off. Uh, you can do it uh, on your device, uh, in, your, in your settings, or you can do it programmatically. Uh, Android, uh, uh, Android OS doesn't help sometimes when you have uh, dialogue, uh, dialogues popping up uh, or notifications. They may shadow part of your view, and if you are testing this one, yeah, that's failed. Uh, API calls. Uh, as Sandeep said, if you are, like, Wiremog is the way we would recommend you to work with the API, just to mock the responses from the server, because then you can be sure that you run your test in isolation. You don't rely on any network conditions. Let's say your API is down, there's no network. So you basically are asking for the flakiness if you are calling the real servers. Uh, okay, so what you can do to remove the flakiness? Uh, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. You have to check every single test, usually this is a case by case. You have to understand what's going on with the test, what's wrong, and then you can, okay, what can I do with this? Uh, sometimes, if you are extremely lucky, you can just add scrolling to the view, and it helps in many, many cases. Uh, and I'll show you what's the, what it's all about. So this is the layout uh, on, this is, I think this is uh, Nexus 5 low resolution. And this is the same layout on Shiny Pixel XL. Uh, so as you can see, if you run the test, for example, on your machine, uh, testing on, on, on a Pixel, you'll see that, okay, I want to express so, uh, you want to verify that the show more and the features, uh, the featured restaurants text are in a place. But if you run the same test on the, ne on the Nexus 5 low res, you will see that they are not there. So if for some reason, like your, your tests, before you, you create a PR, you run, obviously you run all your UI tests, uh, they're fine, so you push, and then CI fails, then that's the first reason, first thing to check. If you're running your test on the same device as your CI. Uh, there's also like a one gotcha. If you, if you add scrolling to one of your views, it doesn't, make, doesn't mean that other tests will pass. So let's say I'm first checking that the, the, uh, the text uh, featured restaurants uh, is visible, and then I'll check if the button is visible. I'll add scrolling to the uh, matcher when I'm checking, when I'm looking for the featured restaurants, and then I'll verify and everything is fine. But if my test starts from the going to the button where I didn't add scrolling, yeah, uh, the test fails. Uh, you shouldn't rely on timing in your UI tests. Uh, if you are if you know, uh, if you're using Rx Java, just like, yeah, I know it's like 2015, 16, but yeah, if you are still using this in your project, uh, and if you're familiar with something which is called Throttle, uh, I'm not sure if you heard about it, it's, uh, it's an operator which emits events per window. So there's a Throttle first and Throttle last, depends on if you want to emit the event 
which happened first or the last one. Uh, so it basically samples the input and sends it in a, in a separate uh, time. You, you may use it for the edit text. If, uh, if you type something on the edit text and you don't want to send query to, to your API, you can just sample this, right? So let's say every, I don't know, every second, let's say I, I will get the input from the user and I will, I will call my backend. Uh, and as, if you test it manually, it would be fine, it would be absolutely fine, and it works. But Espresso types much faster than user. So it may happen that, for example, you miss the time window and there will be no, no uh, emit. Nothing will be emitted because, yeah, you miss the window. Uh, so don't rely on any aspect uh, with the time. Uh, and as I mentioned before, Espresso relies on the mechanism, on the synchronization between threads and may not be aware that you are still doing something. You are loading something, your fancy animation is going on, hiding the screen, or something like this. So we have a really nice mechanism which is called idling, idling, idling resources, uh, which is provided by uh, Espresso. Uh, have you used it? Like, don't know? Okay, there's one person, okay. Two, three, four, five, whoa, okay. There's many. Uh, so if I say something wrong, please correct me. Uh, so. What's, uh, what's the adding resources is about? Uh, so it's a mechanism uh, that we can say to Espresso that I'm still doing something. It's like manually you say, okay, I'm still doing something and then I finished. Because if it's your like, custom animation, you're, 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 you do something on, uh, on your own, you know exactly when it starts and when it ends. Uh, the most, uh, I'll say common one, uh, is something you may heard is uh, called count, uh, counting adding resource. It's basically like a counter. When you are busy, you incre increase the counter. When you are not busy, when you are idle, you decrease the counter. And Espresso waits to, for the value to be zero. If it's zero, it means, okay, uh, I can run my tests. Uh, yeah, so you can use it, idling resources, you can use it for when you have uh, custom animations, any sort of dialogues, uh, progress bars, or web views. Uh, the only downside uh, is that you have to add code to pass your test in the production code. But I think we can live with this. Uh, and something which is important to say, idling resources do not speed up Espresso. It will slow down the test. So we shouldn't be busy longer than we should, right? So we, know, we all know that we, shouldn't, we should avoid all the slips in the test. This is the, this is the worst way. That's why we have the idling resources, because we can minimize the time when we wait for the result. Uh, and that will be all from the tips. And now we'll be talking about hacks or tricks, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there'll be things that you probably never need, you will never need in the app. Uh, or if you need it, it will be like once in your 20 years or like no, 20 years, right? Like in your career, once in a lifetime. Uh, but we find that it's useful to know. Uh, yeah, because of the one case. Uh, so something you may do. Uh, you may extend the idling resources if you need uh, more control on this. So if you have to do something else with idling resources, you can extend the idling resources interface. In the, and in this example, we added, uh, okay, so that's the interface, basically. We uh, have a function with a get name, uh, we check if it's idle, and then we register the uh, transition. And we added two extra functions, which is like uh, busy and idle. I want to do something when uh, I'm busy, something extra, and uh, when, I, when I'm done. Uh, and so if we extend our interface for the adding resources, we can hook it into the app via Android JUnit Runner. So if you have uh, your custom implementation of JUnit Runner, in the on create, you can uh, get the uh, instance of adding resources, and you can register your wrapper. Uh, and how can you use this? If you have a web view, for example, and when you load the page, we just say the wrapper is busy or wrapper I'm idle. Uh, another mechanism you may or may not, or maybe not supposed to use, uh, is called uh, read write lock. Uh, it comes from the Java Util concurrence lock. So you know, this is like something not very often, uh, you won't find it very often in your, in your code. Uh, and this is basically a mechanism you can use to Pause and resume. 
So if you are using WireMock, for example, there's no way that WireMock will pause. Uh, it emits immediately. If you want to sort of mock uh, the delay, or if you want to uh, check something between the call is back, you can use, uh, you can use the uh, read-write log. And it's, it's super simple, like all the other logs, you just lock it, and then you unlock it. Uh, and there's one more, which is called view actions. Uh, and I think you're familiar with the uh, view matter interface from Espresso. So if you have a custom matter, if you want to have a custom matter, you extend the, uh, one of the view matter interfaces. But there's another interface uh, provided by Espresso, and it's view action. Uh, okay, so let's uh, have a look how it looks like. Uh, if you extend the interface, it gives you an access to uh, something which is called UI controller. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard about this one. The interface of uh, UI controller looks more or less like this. So it, UI controller gives you an access to the main thread. So it's super powerful, uh, but with a great power comes great responsibility, right? So you, if you really, really, really want, for some reason, which is not recommended, but you may loop on the main thread. So this may be useful if you want to do something like a retry. You want to execute an action on your view. It fails for some reason, but you want to retry. So that's why you can override uh, your view actions. Uh, okay, and that will be basically all. Just to sum up, uh, robot is a great pattern to uh, separate your implementation, uh, to separate the concern of your, of your test, separate uh, how do you do something from what do you do this. Uh, Flank with the test orchestrator, they're amazing tools to run your tests in parallel. Uh, if you haven't played with it, I would strongly recommend, because it will speed up your execution. Uh, and don't just put uh, at ignore annotation of your flaky tests, uh, because it's super important to have a good test, to have a suit that you can rely on, because then you can do whatever the factoring you want, but you know that you have a solid test behind you, so you won't basically break, break anything. So you can do whatever you up you want, and we'll be fine. Uh, okay, and uh, some sources, if you want to dig a bit more, this is the talk of Jake Wharton uh, I mentioned before about the testing robots uh, and the documentation for Flank. And that's all. Thank you.